Welcome to the final part of series 13. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that it has been a really difficult week for a lot of us in the gaming community as we come to terms with how much work there is to be done. But I also want to acknowledge that there are so many people who are working hard to overcome the toxicity that we've seen and are making and doing amazing things. Making this show has opened my eyes up to some of the bright and beautiful things going on in the gaming world, and it's my hope that we can raise those voices and help those people succeed. A lot of us are feeling pretty exasperated and exhausted right now, but the community that has grown up around this show, and so many others, gives me hope that there is a better future ahead. Through trial, to triumph. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time, we created a group of characters for Edifice. This episode, we are going to discuss the character creation process. We are super excited to welcome back Devin George, the designer of this game. Devin, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself again and tell us about what you are working on and the character you made in our last episode? Yeah, and thank you for having me back. (laughs) Um, So... Hi, uh, my name is Devin, and I am an artist and game designer. I mostly do illustrations. I've done stuff for um, Shadow of the Cabal, the main character art for SOTC2. Also appeared on that uh, as some guest voices. My character that I made, my human being, my bean, their name is Marina Hermes, and they are a doctor. They're also the threshold archetype, which is the creator. They were a soldier and saw the worst of the city-state that they originated from and were also was also the person who escaped with uh, Clairvoyance, who is the reincarnated deity of a world-long past. They also have a limb, and I think it might be an arm. They have an arm, which is made of old technology, which is like super advanced sci-fi that is similar to magic and works and harnesses magic. Um, And they want to make that technology available to other people and want to create it and replicate it. But they have that arm, which they're keeping secret. That's their secret. (laughs) Uh, And that's how they know that it is possible. That's awesome. Amelia, why don't you tell us about your character? Sure. My character is Dahlia Luminous. I am the... Uh, the pediment archetype. So that is like the romantic. Yes. Her secret is that she does not believe in this god child that we are raising. She is a worshiper of a different deity. But she is uh, the caretaker of this sanctuary space that we're living in. Um, Hellebore Sanctuary. And so you are all you are all all up in my space right now. Um, <laughs> We're just house guests, right? For five yes. years. <laughs> yes, my house guests for the last five years. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's a little bit of uh, tension there as you are raising this god that I don't believe in. <laughs> um, Ryan, what about your character? Yeah, my character. Her name is Iriana Desence. Uh, she goes by Iri for short. Uh, she is the famed singer Iridescence, and uh, she has a uh, an old technology uh, musical instrument that she uses for her performances, and uh, she accidentally activated it um, one day at her home and uh, pretty much gravely injured the one that she loved, uh, which scared the you know, stuff out of her. And she went on the run. (laughs) (laughs) stuff Ended up in Hellebore. Yeah, ended up in Hellebore. And it was uh, uh, just a a place where she could hide uh, from this. But she she wrote songs about this prophecy of the, of clairvoyance. And that basically uh, cemented the deal of taking along with this doctor to to find this uh, this 
sanctuary effectively. Let's also talk about our edifice, which in this case is clairvoyance, Mm -hmm. which is not a standard edifice at all, which is fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we decided, um, Ryan, you kind of put this out there at the beginning to say that our edifice, this thing that we are trying to build together is a person. Mm -hmm. And so we are raising this child that is a reincarnated God um, away from the world because apparently this prophecy says that this child will take on the traits of the place that they are raised. And clearly... Mm. We want this child to take on the traits of us, <laughs> this yeah. sad I mean, mess of people. Clearly, we're qualified. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, my cousin, who was the was married to, like, the, the bad city state that we're in that's, like, very warlike, was the one who is, like, the biological parent and gave them to, uh, gave her to me to protect because she knew that. Because they knew that clairvoyance, she couldn't grow up in title. Mm -hmm. So we all have a little bit of history because I think also she's connected or the the, uh, parent is also connected to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were. um, I think we decided former lovers before Mm -hmm. this child was born. And so I think that I slightly blame you for not being able to take care of this person that I loved. Nice. Yes, because you delivered the child. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. I think that we've settled that that's probably the mother. Then. Yes. I feel like we've settled that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think That so. would make the most sense. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, because I, I felt like that's where we were leaning. Um, I mean, it could mm-hmm. be the father, but I I, I feel yeah. like we're definitely leaning toward mother. Um, I think so. It would make the most sense because then the, the father would be away during the birth because they are a big, important person mm-hmm. in the military. Also, yeah. a mother can't general? be away during the birth because yeah, that's kind of birth right. works. <laughs> Listen, exactly. Let me Having done it at... twice, I can tell you I had to be there. <laughs> Wait, let's uh-huh. talk about seahorses really quickly. Um, <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> so, no, no, no. Is it the, the general? Is it the general? I oh, we we almost have to make the general be the father. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rex Noir. <laughs> so technically, her Rex name Noir. is Clairvoyant Baleful. <gasps> Clairvoyant Baleful. Oh my gosh, that's so good. So, anyway, okay. Sorry for completely <laughs> distracting, but yeah. So our edifice is, uh, as you said, is this little girl, which, as I said, isn't a standard edifice because usually an edifice, uh, the like original concept, the easiest concept to grok is it's a building that you're building. Uh-huh. But the next kind of I feel like step to like take that away from that is a you're building like a, a group or like a movement. Mm-hmm. And then the next one is kind of like a goal where you're all building towards a goal. And then uh, even above that, I feel like we've gone even wilder, which is a person, <laughs> which is so cool. Have you had people make a person before? No, this is the first time. I'm really oh, excited. This is so good. This is so I'm cool. so excited that we could try out something that you haven't done before. Uh-huh. I'm so about it. Um <sighs> I love our little like I love our little story that we've made up and like I know that normally you wouldn't share the secrets and stuff like that so we've shared more mm-hmm. than we would like so now we can never play this game. No. Um, it's really heartbreaking, <laughs> but to, like I have love, to write the book now. <laughs> yes, I love this this complicated story that we've come up with. Mm-hmm. I'm very excited about it. and like just all having to like work toward this same goal even though we're like not all about it. It's so good. Ah. It is so good. I love this. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things about the fact that this is a shorter game and it's built in a three act way is that it is built to feel like a movie or like a book. So it is supposed to feel like a short story, like a bite sized story that you're mm-hmm. like has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And at the end, you're satisfied and you don't necessarily want to continue with the characters, but you feel fulfilled in the story that was told. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that now we each have to write. Um, how the story goes from our character's point of view. Oh my god! Oh, no. <laughs> oh my character would be such a unreliable narrative a narrator. Well, I, exactly. I think we all would, and that's like, mm-hmm. oh, I would love that. I love. But we that. would also have to like decide like how it ends together. I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think we could play this if we really, really wanted to. It, there would kind of lose sort of the fun of of showing the secret. But if we really, uh-huh. really wanted to, we could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you would just have to use your meta knowledge and kind of store it away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hit me mm-hmm. up. Which happens in plenty of games. Mm-hmm. Definitely. We can write this book. Mm-hmm. We can write How this about book. 
<laughs> well, uh, for now, let's go ahead and dive into our segment that we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts. In this segment, we talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it feels in the system compared to others. But first, Devin, we want to ask how you got into role playing games in the first place. How did you end up here? <laughs> Oh. I had three starts. Uh-oh. So I'm going to try and keep this short. <laughs> I played GURPS. I was like 12. Yeah, it was, It was. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think it was a lot to throw a 12-year-old into. Yeah, that's a lot to like. Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, wow. I, I might have been closer. It was 12 or 13. I was definitely in middle school. But I had a friend who's actually was someone who inspired me to draw art as well. Um, but I had a friend who ran a game and was like, we're going to use GURPS. And I distinctly remember that character like really distinctly um she was me uh her name was Rochelia Ander Ooh, um that's a good yeah name. she was supposed to mm-hmm. we we had a bunch of character creation points left over and when we went into the magical world I was supposed to get magic powers and we never got that far but the second time but then I kind of like forgot what those were and I didn't know there was anything else called that and I it was really crunchy which made me kind of iffy on it I think because I'm I like story building a lot. And I'm not saying Crunchy's bad. Crunchy's just not for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I (laughs) went and uh, played in a game that was ran by the lead of an anime club at the library that I went to. (laughs) Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And she ran a game and uh, she ran D&D and I played a rogue whose name was Devessa, who was also me, uh, (laughs) but a halfling. (laughs) So he was me, but short this time. I've gotten away from that. I don't play me anymore. I only play trips that I enjoy. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I play, uh, I sure put elements of, of, of me and everything because that's what you do in your role play. But um, mm-hmm. I played that. I loved it. I didn't remember that it was called Dungeons and Dragons. I genuinely just forgot that it was called Dungeons and Dragons. And I went home mm-hmm. and I dug up my GURPS book and I was like, I loved that so much. I like the idea of like finding places that no one has found. And I mashed together the rules of GURPS and D&D from what I remembered stole a d6 from my parents uh star trek monopoly set <laughs> and i ran a game for my cousins which i meshed D and grouped together <laughs> oh my god what like what what does that system look like those are like not good <laughs> a mess it looks <laughs> like a mess way simplified because i like cut every rule that i didn't care about i had like I, because I couldn't remember all the stats from Dean. Remember, I, okay, in this one, I was like a little bit older, so I was like 13 or 14. Right, but still, yeah. Yeah, but I couldn't remember all of the stats. So, like, like I couldn't remember if it was intelligence. So I used IQ from GURPS or something. And you just, you had an AC, which was rolled to hit with like, but it was modded for like a DC. It was a mess, but it worked. And my cousins loved it. And they still talk about it. And that oh, cool. really makes me really happy. But, um, and then I, and when I was still a little bit later in high school, I ended up coming across an Acquisitions Incorporated video. And I was like, oh, it was called D&D. And then I started running a gaming group. Um, and that's how I, I actually found out what it was called and started actually running it and, and knowing what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so funny, though. Just like, I couldn't remember what it's mm-hmm. called, so I just, like, made up a game. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I, I feel like that make sense with who I am though right, like it's like, still yeah, tracks totally. <laughs> like in the middle of a game if someone's like oh I don't know how I do that I'm like no rule we're just gonna make it up roll mm-hmm. we'll see I have yeah. no idea what I'm doing like <laughs> <laughs> that's how it went like I ran a game for my kids that was just like I don't know do you want to be a wizard or something yeah cool I don't know roll a bunch of dice yeah. mm, that looks high enough <laughs> like that's like, <laughs> literally like the first time we role played was just yeah. like Eleanor was like I want to ride a bear and I was like I don't know, roll some dice. I handed her four dice and she rolled them and they were like fours and fives. And I was like, sure, you can ride a bear. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and like, honestly, like running for kids is so good and it's like so low stress too. Oh yeah, and they're so insanely creative that like you don't yeah. have to do anything. I was like, what does this room look like? And Nate was like, there's a buffet, there's blue jello. And like went on to describe <laughs> sure. like yeah. this whole thing. And I was like, cool, I'll just sit back. You let me know how this goes. Yeah, and like <laughs> kids, I mean, you don't have to, it's really easy to please kids when running with kids. So I like ran for a lot of kids once I found out what D&D was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, God, I, I just think it's funny. I had two completely false starts um, before figuring out what the hell I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good, though. Like, I love that that's... And then you just like... But, like, it didn't... 
it wasn't like bad false starts. It wasn't like I had a really awful experience and then eventually came back to it. It was like, this is not how you play, but you know what? I was having fun. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, mm-hmm. That's for me. It's like, I don't think these are the rules, but you know what? We're having a good time. So let's just go. Mm-hmm. I'm sure at some point I'm going to like get partway through a game of edifice and I'll be like, you know what? These rules suck. Let's mod them right now. <laughs> so I was going to be like, this is your own game. And I'm like, no, it's fine. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's, so That's awesome. <sighs> Could you go ahead and tell us about then your personal process for picking and creating characters in any role playing game? So as the GM, no. Um <laughs> 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 I I want to preface this by saying that I don't play very often because I do tend Ooh. to take on the role of the GM. And I've for a while had a lot of trouble actually making characters and playing characters and being a good player. <laughs> I don't think I was a very good player for a while. Um I don't think I kind of knew what I was looking for and what I wanted out of a game. And what I really wanted and what I knew I wanted like later on was I wanted to feel like I wanted to feel like I was contributing Mm -hmm. and driving the story forward. And it's hard to do that when you're playing kind of traditional games. And so kind of as I've I've gotten as I've kind of progressed along my road, along RPGs, I've discovered that I need to play games where I can contribute and I do get to build with the GM. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I just really like being able to build. And if I can't, I kind of get upset. And I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. Mm-hmm. So the answer is I don't have too much of a process because I haven't had a chance to play a bunch of characters that I don't have enough to pull from. Um, but I'd say that character creation happens for me the moment I start role-playing the character. Mm. Putting numbers down on a page, answering secrets are all kind of... Like answering questions about your character, like the 20 questions for L5R, that doesn't say as much about the character to me as like knowing how they role play, Mm -hmm. knowing how they react to certain things, being in the moment and making a decision that they're afraid of X. So my answer is technically I don't do a character creation in my head. I character create in the moment the best and the types of characters I've enjoyed the best are characters that you look at a sheet and you don't see the character, but the moment we play that's where the character is. Hmm. So so I'm really intrigued by that because part of what you have for these archetypes is kind of like this knowledge of how you, how they're meant to be played. So that's like, it's I, super interesting because you don't have to wait that long. Was it like, was that like a, like a moment of like impatience of like, I don't want to wait until we get into the game to figure out how this goes or like, yeah, I mean, it was, it's kind of a, a mechanism for me I, I made it for yeah. me because um, i have problems with this and i know that it's a it's a fast faster way to get into the character mm-hmm. and it's just easier to have an idea of where you're going i think mm-hmm. and i have trouble playing a character when i don't know where i'm going if that makes any mm-hmm. sense it totally well, makes especially, sense. Yeah. yeah, especially for a game that's designed to be a one shot. Yeah, like because like one shot games, you don't you don't have time to kind of build that up, mm-hmm. um, and that's why honestly, I think I might start pulling just for myself, pulling one whenever I have to make another character because for me it'll help guide me. Um, also, because I like story structure and I like writing and I like I think of a lot of role-playing games less in the context of like a video game or RPGs and in the context of RPGs, if that makes sense. But uh, I think about Mm -hmm. it in the context of a, of a book. So it's helpful to know kind of the archetype of how they fit in a book, because to Mm -hmm. me, that's what I'm playing. I'm not really, I'm writing a book. So yeah, exactly. So how do you think character creation in this game stacks up to other systems that you've played like i know that you haven't created a lot of characters but i imagine that like in the process of game designing and even like gming you've looked at that process i think i mean i feel like there's a very clear comparison to be drawn between like ones where you crunch a bunch of numbers because this is a different game where a lot of your character again doesn't exist on your character sheet which as i said Mm -hmm. This game has a lot of me in it, which is a lot of your character doesn't exist on your character sheet. A lot of your Mm -hmm. character exists in the conversation between you and the person to your right Mm -hmm. and to your left and across the table. Your character exists in the card that you drew. So I would say that the character sheet is there to make you trick you into thinking that this is a role playing game or in reality, (laughs) we're all just telling a story together. So I don't know if that's an answer, but I I genuinely can't tell you. It totally is. 
too much because I'm like, yeah. I, I am very biased. So I don't know if I can give you mm-hmm. an entirely unbiased answer to that. To me, it, it feels very, um, it has the same sort of feel to character creation as a lot of the Powered by the Apocalypse games that I've created characters for. So fun fact, I never actually read a Powered by the Apocalypse game until after I created this. <laughs> that just blows my mind because this it's it's got the whole, you know, relationship sort of thing. Uh, it's got the whole like very quick but condensed mm-hmm. character creation which is is just especially remarkable for a one shot because you you kind of need that quick yeah you need to have a fast forward button mm-hmm. exactly so you're not like mathing so much yeah and that's why there's like not a lot of math in it because as i said like math can slow you down because like some people are fast yeah. and some people are slow um with math mm-hmm. i had to count to four you guys and i couldn't do it oh <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry I'm confused uh-huh. Uh, you know, I would say, though, that, like, I know, like, Ryan, you've made a lot of comparisons to PBTA, and I don't know if that's mm-hmm. just because it feels, like, quick and condensed. Like, to me, it didn't necessarily feel like that at all, mm-hmm. um, because there weren't as many, like, like, when I think of PBTA, I think of, like, kind of choose from this list and then flavor it. And I don't think that that's the experience I get. To me, it felt like, here is a writing prompt, now make mm-hmm. a character out of that. And, like... Yes. <laughs> So and like, but that fits with like this sort of storybook kind of like narrative way that you want this game to go, right? Yeah. Also, I want to say that it's not storybook. It's not fairy tale. It's mythic. If that makes Fair. sense. Fair. I mean, like, I to me, I yeah. was like story and yeah. book. It feels like a story and a book. Yeah. It's a story book. Yeah. No, it makes <laughs> with sense. A story <laughs> in it. It's right. a very no, small distinction. Like... It's just a yeah. Yes, no. It's a <laughs> story slash book. We'll put a slash in the middle. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> My brain is just like, it's a story, it's a book, it's a story yeah. book. No, it like, does I know that like a storybook is like a genre. <laughs> uh-huh. That's not what I meant. I meant story slash It's okay, book. I got you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I but it feels like much more like a writing prompt of like, here's a thing that like kind of who they are and what you know about them and like now like use this to make something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I really love the the genre agnostic approach and the like complete open ended basically tablet that is ready to be filled with everything from everybody. Yeah. I think it's so on that on that topic of like it being agnostic, I actually had a thought when I was designing this, and that was you can have a story structure or sorry. It's hard to make a game that's perfectly agnostic Mm -hmm. because you either have to cover everything or you have to make, which is like GURPS, because it covers everything. You have an ability, a disadvantage, an advantage for everything, and you have more splat books than Mm -hmm. you ever need. You could make a coffee table out of that. And then you have Fate, which generalizes, which allows you to become agnostic. And I think that those games can be very hard to approach because they're so open. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wanted to make my game pretty approachable. And so either you make it approachable by the setting being set, so you know the setting, and so the setting can be the thing that's approachable and the rules are Mm -hmm. learned, or you have a structure and the setting is whatever you want. So either like a structure of the the story, you have to tell the story in a specific way. And Mm -hmm. I chose to, I chose the second option, which was I gave you a structure so you, you can approach the world as mm-hmm. the open book and know the structure and the structure is your it's a book surprise um right. <laughs> and so if you read any like kind of action fantasy or action sci-fi ish stories you'll kind of know what you're getting into and most people have or at least watched a movie mm-hmm. and so you know you know you're you're working together and that's why i was like as long as i have that story structure and as long as you're still confined in some kind of box you can be as creative mm-hmm. as you want as in the world and being creative in a world and creating things is really important to me. And I think I'd rather give people tools to create their world than to give someone a world mm-hmm. and tell them to create their stories, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. That makes total sense. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, like there's there's definitely value in both of those. It's very mm-hmm. clear that like telling the story is the part that you are building up that story is like the part that mm-hmm. really like fascinates you. Yes. Um, and so, like, I mean, and, and obviously, like, you don't design games that you don't want to play. Like, that's, you know, you don't make things mm-hmm. that you don't care about. But, like, that that 
part of you definitely shows through in this that like this is the kind of game that you want to play but like that's yes. again you like why would you make something that you don't want to do this is a game exactly. I wanted. What a waste of time. <laughs> yeah. This is a game I wanted yeah. to see in the world and a game that I thought would be really cool. A lot of also a lot of my games, I have a lot of text-based games that I've made that have sprung up out of, oh, I want to RP, but I don't know if I want to RP and I'm kind of awkward on text and I don't know. And I was like, no, I'll just come up with a system. We'll make a text mm-hmm. system. And yeah. s- similar yeah. things have happened for like making mo- mass combat for tomorrow, my mm-hmm. game. I'm going to be like, well, I need it, so I'm going to make it. And I think a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of my, personally, my best concepts and things that I've done, uh, I think, have come out of necessity. And I think art and mm-hmm. invention in general comes out of a necessity, if I can be yes. pretentious necessity enough to say that. Necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> yes, that's, I couldn't get to that. I was like, there's a, there's a thing about this, but I can't get to what exactly it is. <laughs> yes. yes, absolutely. And I think that, mm-hmm. like, I, I mean, I can see the bones of that in this game and you would i mean you have also played l5r a number of times (laughs) and so like you are very aware of like what it's like to play in a much more structured setting too and like you can certainly tell interesting stories in those kinds of worlds yeah it's a very Mm -hmm. different experience yeah i was gonna say i think actually ironically edifice is actually closer to (laughs) it's closer to l5r than it is to D. &D. Mm -hmm. yeah i'd agree with that and I, I really like how the feel of this character creation process for Edifice gives me the same, on a, on a slightly different level, uh, feel of like Descent into Midnight, and uh, as well as uh, Chimera, which I haven't created characters for, uh, but seeing people create characters for it and helping them create the world, mm-hmm. it, it feel it has that sort of feel. To it, yeah. um, I, I don't mean to plug my. <laughs> here, but, uh, well, I mean, but, I think we both. Uh, I think part of it, honestly, I think that's definitely you and me specifically, because I know we approach when we. I when I start stories, I start by genre mashing, and yeah. that's probably why yep. there's like a similarity there, is because like my yeah. first question is always like, "What genres are y'all into?" And then we just mash uh-huh. them together. <laughs> yep, and, and that's that's exactly pretty much how mine starts too. So it, it yeah, it has that very familiar vibe, and I love this whole let's create the world together and then let's create characters that fit into this world and then let's play our story yeah i love collaborative world building like that's Mm -hmm. it's so much fun to me like to just to like build this thing and then get to like play around in it it's it's like it makes it makes you care so much more about it it does you're much more invested actually speaking of okay so my biggest influences because i think have you guys ever played the quiet year I have not. I've, I've heard I've nothing heard but good, good things. things about it. Okay, I've I run want it to. It's. I played that game and my world was changed. <laughs> like genuinely, genuinely. Yeah. Um, Oof. if you get to play it, you I like that and Fiasco are the two big ones for me, and I don't think it's like either one of those. It's definitely its own thing because I was like, I want, I want this to be the separate thing. I don't want it to be a hack. I don't want it mm-hmm. to be a, a whatever. I would say that it's a very small scale. The Quiet Year is like very large scale and it's very broad and you don't have characters, um, which serves it differently. But it's a community based one. And I, mm-hmm. I I love the concept of community and a group of people coming together to do something amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, as I said, that's my kind of my thesis of whenever I run a game is like you're here to feel good <laughs> and to feel like you make a difference and work together. Um, and the fiasco, because I it was it's a thing where you play through scenes and you don't always like each other, which you can make yourself like each other. You, you're everyone like each other in this one, um, which is the mm-hmm. biggest difference. You actually aren't going to all kill each other in the end. Um, yeah. But like I liked I really liked the the table where it was like it decided your your end. But this isn't random because I, I like the idea of deciding your own fate because that's important mm-hmm. to me. That's really cool. All of the edifice is up to grabs because you mm-hmm. you buy your ending first and whatever points you don't use goes into the edifice. So if you have a lot of points, you can buy a good ending and also give points to the edifice. But if you're stingy, mm-hmm. the edifice can fail. So then how do the, the mechanics of character creation uh, reinforce the feel of playing edifice? I'm going to have to point back to probably the archetype cards again mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because they are literally archetypes from a book that's the big one i think yeah i mean, <laughs> I mean you that are makes sense. It, yeah like you are basically picking 
how you want to tell this story. Like when you, Mm -hmm. when you start like putting those archetypes in, it kind of becomes clear, like what kind of story you're going to end up telling Mm -hmm. to a degree. The archetypes that don't make it in are just as important as the ones that do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't have a traitor and we didn't have, you know, I mean, and that's not to say that like that won't happen, but like, we don't have you know. someone in that designated role. We don't have a mentor, so we have to find mm-hmm. our own way. And I think that's that reinforces kind of the the story feel and also the mm-hmm. like story <laughs> story book feel. <laughs> well, like to to me, it I think like the fact that we we picked these character types, with the, we picked these archetypes. None of us are particularly suited. <laughs> to doing anything with this with this edifice this child like not mm-hmm. we're not teachers we're not you know we are not a mentor we are not a caretaker we are not any of those things yeah. and so like that already kind of starts to tell you what the story is going to be is like these people are going to struggle with this because mm-hmm. we are not meant to do this yeah we're going to be good at some things but we're going to be really bad at others and that can be reflected in the dice or maybe we'll surprise ourselves or who knows um, mm-hmm. that's, that's partially why, cause like, I know there's a lot of games that don't have like dice in it, but I think that, I think that dice are very important. I don't like a lot of story-based games have thrown dice out and I think that's good for them if it, if it works, mm-hmm. but I think dice is a, as a, as being a chance, as being a randomized thing, as be meaning that you need to improvise and change your plans is really mm-hmm. important. And it's a very it's very powerful and when applied in the right place it it can make your story much more compelling and take you in twists and turns that you were never expecting mm-hmm. um and that's why like there's still dice in this game and you still roll to succeed but succeeding and failing doesn't always look the it there it's not a binary it's a bit mm-hmm. of a spectrum and like the the fiction will follow as well which ooh, that's a that is a dungeon world thing. I've been listening. I've been reading that. <laughs> the fi- you'll you'll describe yeah, but- the fiction to fit that, um, which means you will mm-hmm. have improvised and you'll have changed the story. Um, and if you mm-hmm. fail at something you are pretty sure you were going to succeed at, the story goes in a way that you weren't expecting. And that's this game is kind of about the little twists in that area. Yeah, and I think that like stories work really well when that's the case, right? Like you don't, because mm-hmm. um, I think that if you're trying to tell the story without that little bit of chance like there's the natural reaction to be like okay everything goes great ta-da like that's not interesting um (laughs) you know like you need flaws and failure and Mm -hmm. things like that to kind of make Mm -hmm. a story but i do like that you have the option to like you know spend points in a different way or you know so like there's there's that element of planning too because life isn't always random chance right Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. there there are some things in life that are you know it could go this way or that could go that way but there are times where you make conscious decisions to say okay this can go a little bit better now but it might be harder later or i can do the hard thing now and have it be better later Mm -hmm. and like that Mm -hmm. is you know how most of us make our decisions and so i like that the mechanics kind of feel that way too of like okay i can do this now um but i'm making problems for myself later or yeah. you know what i'm gonna do the harder thing now so that i can possibly have a better time later on yeah and i think you see that also when you yeah it, it, <laughs> art imitates life and our life imitates art um because you see <laughs> that you see that in books because it's something people go through um and, and but what's really nice about books is you're in their head and you're like very aware of everything they're doing. So you're not always aware of what you're doing in your head. Uh, mm-hmm. But like when you when you are reading it, you can be like, oh, oh, they're being altruistic and they're they're sticking up for what they believe. And I hope they have a good ending. And man, they're trying their best. They might have failed, but they tried their best. And there's somewhere you're like, oh, you shouldn't have made that deal. Oh, that's going to mm-hmm. that's going to bite you in the ass. You know, that's going to bite you in the butt later on. Um, it's like stuff like that. Um it's supposed to mirror that um, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and I think it, I mean, that's the feel that I think that you get from the way that character creation goes too, though, is that like it is that kind of prompt. And so it's very clear that like you are going to be telling a story. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think that it, it works. It works well for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm very happy with this game. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, I think that we've already kind of covered the next question, which is how the process of creating a character sets your expectations for playing this game. And I think that Mm -hmm. it's pretty clear that, like, 
it's a story game. It's a narrative yep. thing. You are telling a story yeah. and you're doing it together. Like yeah. it's very clear from, you know, building the edifice together right at the beginning or like, you know, kind of setting that goal of like, this is a thing that we all have to do and we all have some kind of stake in mm-hmm. that like mm-hmm. this is going to be a collaborative thing. Yeah. I literally right. have a list of writing prompts at the bottom of the, the structure yes. sheet. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can just glance at that and be like, oh, I understand. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's like there's not much else to say there that we haven't said that like it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear what you're doing here. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know where I'm going. Which I like. I mean, and I we I I keep going back to our Starcrossed episode because that's another kind of like storytelling kind of smaller compact game um, that has the same kind of like scenes and things like that. But Mm -hmm. like I love Starcrossed like a lot. It's, I know, oh gosh. It's so um, good. It, it is. But, like, that's another thing that we talked about with Alex is, like, I want it to be really clear when I look at this character sheet of, like, is this a game for me? Mm-hmm. You know, she's like, if I look at a character sheet and see, like, you know, weapons and, you know, all that kind of stuff, like, I know that mm-hmm. this game is about battle. Mm-hmm. And, like, this one you have, you know, right on the, the sheet for the structure, like, w- you know, you have these kind of prompts. And so it's very clear that, like, we are building something together. This is a collaborative thing. Mm-hmm. And we are telling a story. And so, like, it's right there on that sheet. Like, here's what this game is. And you don't, before you even get into any of the other rules, like, you know what this is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And I yeah. I love that. Yeah. I like knowing, <laughs> I like, I I don't like surprises. Yeah. I don't <laughs> mind secrets, but I don't like surprises. I like to know what I'm getting I, into. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want people to know. I want people to have a an expectation, not too high, because I don't want to let anyone down. Um, <laughs> no, no, but there's something to be said for but, like it's you are spending time on a thing. Like you want to know what you're getting into. Mm-hmm. Like what am mm-hmm. I spending my time on? Yeah, and I think being being as upfront about that because like I I want you to know because like the rules are so small and so simple and short that I kind of have to be as transparent as possible. There isn't mm-hmm. like a line somewhere that's like, and then you screw everyone over. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I when you're especially when you're writing shorter games you have to be as to the point as possible um especially because uh they're not investing as much time in reading this Mm -hmm. so there's less investing because like if i'm reading a book uh, a big rpg book and i'm halfway through i'm gonna finish it even if i'm like "Eh." um because i I (laughs) but it also has a lot more time to like it has a lot more opportunity to like grab your attention exactly like you don't have a whole lot of time in that you know like 10 pages or whatever Mm -hmm. To like it's get me to you, you don't have a lot of time to convince me. Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's eleven. Never mind. We're good. Um, <laughs> I don't know. If, <laughs> no, I don't know yeah, I, I didn't count them. <laughs> I have to be like, yeah, no, it's true. When you're when you're being shorter and you're being, you have to be like punchier and you have to be more to the point because you only have so mm-hmm. many words. And I'm not interested in putting more more words than you need in there, yeah. um, because I think I think that you want to get playing. I'm interested in just getting playing. I want to understand how mm-hmm. it works. I want to know my expectations. I want to know um, how to set the tone for other people who are playing and how to explain mm-hmm. it. And that's it. I really don't need much more than that. And and like I was debating on putting in like <sighs> trying to couch it for new players, but I genuinely don't. But the people who are going to be playing this will have at least heard of D&D. And I mm-hmm. think that it's not the scariest story game out there. For people mm-hmm. who've only played games with GMs, if that makes sense. Because mm-hmm. yeah. you, you still have a character sheet. You still have stats. You still have a class. You have two different types of glasses. You still technically have hit points. Um, it's just a lot more freeform than you're used to. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a... Uh, my goal was kind of to make it a pretty accessible game in that way. Um, to make it something that it was pretty easy to introduce someone to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think a thing that like GMless games don't get enough credit for is that like... Being, having now done it a whole (laughs) one time, like being a GM is a lot of work and it's kind of scary. And like Mm -hmm. there are very few people aside from you apparently and your weird experience who like don't play a bunch of games before they run them. Like there are Mm -hmm. people that are like, you know what, I want to play this game, so I guess I'll run it. Here we go. Um, But like a lot of people play games before they run them. Um, and, like, that can be kind of a barrier to entry in a lot of ways of, like, finding someone that can run this game for you. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that GMless games don't get enough credit for, like, their ability to bring in new people because yeah. you're all mm-hmm. on the same playing field. If there is nobody, like, in charge, you can all just figure it out together and you're all doing the same thing. Yeah, and you can oh, all you know? come to the table as someone who is inexperienced 
and like right and there's, there's no, no pressure to like yeah yeah you're not pressured to like know the rules or like mm-hmm. be in charge because you are <laughs> all there doing the thing together yeah yeah I totally no. agree. Um, I yes, hundred percent correct. <laughs> yes, 100%. good, great, great. <laughs> All right, moving on. That's awesome. No, <laughs> I mean my thoughts exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot of things to love about the character creation in this system. Uh, but what would you say? Uh, you hinted at it uh, a couple of times. What would you say is the biggest flaw of character creation in Edifice? I would say that the biggest fault in character creation is the fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think they tell you about your character. I don't think they do anything. I mean, like I like the mechanic. I like the idea mm-hmm. of short term versus long term. I'm not happy with it. I don't think that it's been flushed out as much as it should be. Mm-hmm. And my hope is the uh, my hope. I know the final version will be um, stronger and mm-hmm. have a contribute something to your character because I feel like everything else on the sheet does. Mm-hmm. Um, because I mean name obvious but like my profession tells me my my role my archetype tells me my role in the story my secret is secret and it's fun and like that tells me what i'm willing to not talk Mm -hmm. about um my qualities tell me how i can resolve problems but my fault really doesn't tell me anything uh Mm -hmm. other than i guess i'm prideful and i feel like there's got to be a better solution to that i don't know it Mm -hmm. yet i will talk to me next year (laughs) yeah Yes. But also, I, dear listeners, if you have some brilliant idea. Yeah, if you have a brilliant mm-hmm. idea. No, um, <laughs> I wouldn't mind. But um, I wouldn't mind, like, to talk about it because I think it's mm-hmm. an interesting. I like the conundrum. mechanic of it. I like that, you know, like I said, like deciding, do I do this now or save it for later? Or, you know, yeah. like I like that kind of mechanic of it. Mm-hmm. So, Me like, too. I don't want it to go away. But, yeah, I think you're right that, like, when we got to that part, it was like, well, this doesn't. This doesn't say anything. Like I don't, I don't know how it it goes with the rest of what mm-hmm. I've done. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that the issue the issue is you know how everything looks and everything you've done gives you an idea of your character and like how to play your character and how your character fits in the world. Um, as I said, your archetype tells you how you fit in the story. Your mm-hmm. your profession tells you how you fit in the world. Your secret tells you what you're willing to die for. Your qualities tell you what you can do, but your fault doesn't tell you you don't you can't picture it mm-hmm. and i think that's that's the big drawback of it i, I think that the, as, a, as a, i agree as a mechanic i enjoy it i think that being able to sacrifice your your sacrifice one thing for another is a important choice and i've seen mm-hmm. people gleefully like mark off like four of them and be like ha, 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 ha. um really <laughs> screwing myself over let's do this and like I wouldn't. I don't want to take that away, because so many people mm-hmm. enjoy that, and I enjoy that. Mm-hmm. And oh, I'm just like, yes, look at all these dice I'm rolling. Boy, am I gonna regret this later. <laughs> um, yeah, I just need to find a way to make it feel like it tells you something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just. I think it just needs to be like woven in more. Like yeah. it feels mm-hmm. like it's just not quite like. Yeah. See, a real like it's not. It's still a little lumpy. It's just you have to smooth out that kickback. Exactly. A bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Originally, it was something similar to like. Uh, to, you know how like in Fate you write like a high concept and uh, three like attri- attribute what are they called? Uh, have you guys played Fate? We aspects. Not- they're called aspects. 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 You've I've- only played it once, but they're called aspects. <laughs> I've run it a couple times because what haven't I run? <laughs> um, so I- it's on our short list to cover. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a pretty good system. Um, it's not my favorite system in the world. Sorry, but that goes to. Uh, uh, the quiet ear but uh, they have like aspects and it's like you write a sentence about what it is and that that's how it is and, and I was th- I was originally it was originally something like I want revenge on whatever but I felt like it was one too many things to come out of the blue because secret is already so hard to do I didn't want to give someone mm-hmm. something else that's similar um, mm-hmm. yeah I think it might turn to be just something like selfishness and you mark off selfishness and because I think that this game is a lot about at the end selflessness versus selfishness and so that might mm-hmm. be that's what i'm playing with right now but i don't know if that's the final what if each archetype has like a like even like a fill in the blank kind of sentence or something where you can like finish Ooh. it but like the basis of it is there i like that that's really cool i like that too like what what does that archetype struggle against like and what would be the downfall what, what, of that kind of person 
what could That's they give point. in to selfishly that that makes sense for that character's story? And so then it's like not so totally broad, but like you have like a little bit more of a framework to. You need a box. I need to give you a yeah. box. Um, so I think one of the things in that case, I definitely think either way, I think fault is going to become selfishness mm-hmm. because I think or some a word equivalent to that. Mm-hmm. Yes, because I think that like if the whole thing is about working together and building up this thing, mm-hmm. like that would be like even if you are prideful or whatever, like ultimately the selfishness is the thing that's the problem. Yeah, like you mm-hmm. doing something for yourself rather than for the community is what is going to cause a problem. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that I think that that can be expressed in any way, and I think narrowing down how it's expressed is is too much of a box which is what what we were getting with like hate and whatever which mm-hmm. is honestly i think it's a lot of a holdover from the alpha um yeah because i don't think i mm-hmm. had a good idea on that one and so i was like i'm not sure how to fix this entirely and i'm gonna fix it by doing x y and z but I, it's still not perfect but mm-hmm. i'm gonna go forward with that um but yeah that's that's my big one that i'm every time i've played i've been like ah oh, god <sighs> like something about it's just like a little bit mm-hmm it's a little bit clunkier. Like, it's yeah. just not, yeah. It's the flat note in a symphony. Mm-hmm. Yes. But it, but it has that core, that that core idea that I believe will, will blossom into something cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I think that, like, and I, I honestly think that, like, the mechanic is the harder part there. And, like, mm-hmm. I like the mechanic. I think that you just got to figure out how to, like, I need to massage flavor it. it. Yeah, I need to massage it so that it all eventually fits mm-hmm. into one nice, perfect, yeah, mm-hmm. circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's other stuff I need to tweak as well, but it doesn't have to do the character. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I could spend a long time talking about, like, all the little tweaks that I need to make that are uh, going to take a while to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask, how do you think building the edifice together changes the tone of this game? I think I think that it wouldn't be edifice if it didn't have an edifice, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. So, like, I wrote this question before we had gone through this process. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, so, like, now it feels really obvious and stupid to ask. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it... it to me, I mean, you're the designer, so like, really, you should answer this question. But I'm gonna tell you what I think because it's my show. Um, <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm, you're you're less biased than I am, so you'll probably give a to better. <laughs> I spent I spent a really long time like analyzing this, so I'm like deep in the weeds, and I'm like someone with some perspective, please. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, it is the very first taste that you get of the fact that this is about community, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it is from more of like a meta standpoint. Of, like, we are already working on building this thing mm-hmm. as a community out of the game mm-hmm. that, like, that reflects what we are about to do in the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that Edifice encourages, um, and I don't I don't know if it's stated outright in the beta, but the idea is that you've, are, you've been working on the Edifice for a while before this game mm-hmm. starts. Because the game works the best when you know each other and you guys are established in an area. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's something that should be in the final because that's something definitely to talk about um, as like the ideal situation for this game. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, and like already building it, like just talking and verbally talking about it as people sitting around a table, I think Mm -hmm. also helps push that towards like we've been here for a while because we're we've already talked about how it began and therefore we don't need to play that out. Right. I can I can see like. The edifice is a very specific part of the character creation process and the world building process. You can build the world uh, completely collaboratively and you would completely care about the world. You could build your characters um, and have that collaboration between them. But if the edifice is always static, Mm -hmm. if you're always like you're building a building, Mm -hmm. you know, that that takes away from some of that. Uh, especially replaying it multiple times, yeah, uh, it would take away some of that impact of uh, the connection that you as a person feel to the thing that you are building in the game as characters. Agreed. Yeah. And I was a really, I really, really wanted it to have some re- replayability. Um, I think once you play it enough to where you've played all the archetypes at least once, you might kind of lose a little bit of replayability. 
because you're a little like, ah, I got the whatever again. But there's also like always a different way to interpret it because if you're mm-hmm. playing with someone diff- with a group, diff- different group of people each time, it's going to be a completely different game. Oh, yeah. I mean, and you, I'm sure you can still get fatigue from it because like... <laughs> I, you can get fatigued. I mean, like everything in moderation. Exactly. Like, just uh-huh. don't overdo it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um. You know. I mean, like you can get D and D fatigue too. Uh-oh. So. <laughs> right here I am. Yep. Um, <laughs> I had it after, like the first session. D and D is a very lovely game, and f- for other people. Mm-hmm. Um. No, but I think that like the the process of doing that like already made me feel like super invested in this thing, and like. Yes. I was already like, yeah, we got to do this. We got to like, we have to raise her. Like, we have to make sure she's right. Good. Like, yeah. we made this. Like, we made this really cool kid. Like, now we got to. Now, now I gotta. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I spent. I put all this time and effort in. <laughs> so, like, I, I think that like going through that process of like building it up together on top of like creating our own out of game community, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um, already like made me in game like care about this thing yeah like it was mm-hmm. it, you know it was like I, we built this up like i have to care about it now like we've we've done to we've gone too far <laughs> i can't stop now <laughs> um so like it's already put me into that place mm-hmm. and one of the things that i think is kind of interesting about the edifice and this is true in every game is the edifice is kind of the singular it's almost like an it's the sun and we're all planets and all the scenes we are our planets are we play our planets around the sun and we don't ever go to the sun like one of the things about edifice is there's only one question about the edifice on the sheet or two technically if you count the what do you what does this Mm -hmm. edifice mean to the world but there's only quite one question about it Mm. on this character sheet and whatever but we still built our entire characters entirely around this edifice Mm -hmm. and when Mm -hmm. you play edifice usually you talk about the edifice, you fight for the edifice, you argue for the edifice. But honestly, the edifice isn't in the scenes that often. It might be different for this one because <laughs> she's a character. Yeah. But usually it's like something that you don't see very often and you're not like interacting with. And so it becomes kind of it becomes a concept. It becomes you fighting for a concept and not necessarily a thing. Well, I think some of that is like the the GMless nature too. That's of, true. Like, yeah, you don't, you don't have know, someone I mean, to sit there. At least there in our ex- case, like there is nobody p- to play clairvoyance. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. So one of the things it does is if someone is willing in a scene, there uh, one person mm-hmm. can play an NPC. You just can't um, assist or resolve the scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can't. Uh, you can't write write your own happy ending there with the NPC. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> but you can. Like the the idea is that like if you feel comfortable and you don't mind not being able to assist and it makes sense, then you should. You should play that NPC. Um because you're writing a story and you're not uh power gaming <laughs> or anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um and there'll be other scenes for you to be in and maybe it'll play it past to someone else. And um, I definitely, as I said, I, I want to write something about like something larger. I think it's very small in the beta, but I think that that really needs to be discussed um, mm-hmm. as just kind of like a willingness to step into the role of an NPC. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that I think the edifice is very important, but also it is one of the least seen things because um, it is kind of like. It's kind of the black hole. If to to put yep. away the sun metaphor, to the black hole we're circling around. Yeah, mm-hmm. interesting. Okay, so this game focuses a lot on community and interaction between players. Uh, so, how did you factor that interaction into how you build the characters? Well, I hate to come constantly go back to the archetype cards, but that really is kind <laughs> of the core of the character mechanic, because yeah. it is everything on the archetype card is about your relationship to other characters Mm -hmm. and not to the world and not to NPCs. It's all about inter-party relationships or inter-party or inter-party makes it sound like D&D. Inter-group relationships or inter-group drama. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I, I wanted to emphasize that. And that's why that is the way that is. And secrets are also secret because, uh, it's fun to reveal spooky secrets about your character, about your your mm-hmm. OCs do not steal that, you know, that yeah. to your Absolutely. friends. Because you're like, did you know, actually, my character is a robot. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, that's fun. <laughs> that's really fun. 
uh-huh. surprise, my character is actually, I don't know, something cool. But you know what I mean. Um, and that's <laughs> yes. that's where the factor, the factoring that in was more like, I we need as many mechanics and as many things that give these people a reason to role play and like, uh, kind of like a like rub up each, against each other in either a good way or a bad way, depending on what type of characters they've made. Um, but to give you guys as many opportunities as possible to have fun and interesting interactions. Yeah, and I think that they do. Like, I especially think that the secrets like yeah. give you a lot of opportunity to. Um, sort of explore those interactions with other yeah. people and to like it, i mean it forces you to have to talk to the other players and figure things out and um mm-hmm. like you can't play the game with you don't <laughs> especially if because you have you literally have incentive on these cards because if you do something in a specific way you get dice back and then you can go and roll and do more things mm-hmm. and you get more mm-hmm. spend total and then you get more points at the end um, mm-hmm. And then if you role play in another a specific other way, you can penalty and you can lose more, and it's and it's it's a bad for your character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I want to discuss our little group that we made. <laughs> how do you think that we would work together? Like how how would how would this story go? <laughs> this is the fan fiction section of the podcast. Yes. Uh-huh. I'm ready. <laughs> Um, I'm so excited for this. I don't, I got, I really don't know. Cause as I said, I know I, this, you don't know exactly how this game is going to turn out until you play mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that we, I feel like it would be a good time no matter what. Um, yeah. I definitely think there'd be a lot of inter-party drama. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think I your kinda, character and my character have a lot of opportunity to like yeah. not get along. I kind of, feel like my character would be the uh peacemaker uh, yeah the peacemaker the the person the, the mediator between both of you uh as the leader art archetype mm-hmm. because i'm trying to keep this group together and and lead us into this this uh prophetic direction mm-hmm. i guess and uh you two having this sort of uh like antagonistic relationship yeah this antagonistic mm-hmm. relationship in history that kind of ties you together um it really uh yeah it really really sets the tone for some really good like back and forth between everybody mm-hmm. yeah absolutely yeah i definitely picture you being the person that's like in between us mm-hmm. being like we have to do this we have to work together i think interestingly <laughs> enough i i don't know Ryan, if if Erie is the leader, leader, right. but I, she, right, she, I her, think she, yeah, she, uh, yep. but I think she is definitely our spiritual leader, the one with the vision, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, because I, oh, I that's tend true. to the prophecy came from you, yeah. I tend to fall into like a, a, whenever I play a character, I do tend to be a little leaderly, which is yeah. a, a thing that I. I, as a person, have a habit of falling into, um, which would probably <laughs> mean I would end up taking a little bit of a leader ego, uh, mm-hmm. go at it because that's, yeah. <laughs> character creation. Yeah, I, I do I'm, leaders I'm, on accident. <laughs> I imagine your yeah. character is the person who's like most experienced mm-hmm. and like the most. Um, I'm the physical leader, but I am not the emotional leader. Right. Well, and just like the person who is most prepared to like actually deal with the situation that we're in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, not like emotionally capable oh, God, of no. like being in charge yeah. of these people. I only play emotionally mm-hmm. stunted characters. <laughs> <laughs> same Mm -hmm. just in different ways Um, so (laughs) i'm wondering like which prompts do you think would look like what in our world in our story oh yeah for the like for the uh, chapters Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's like chapter one i'm trying to find one oh no i closed it Ah. do you need the link no i have it i just closed the tab that it was in i my one of my favorite prompts in this and i think has generated the most interesting uh, outcome is a trial for questionable offenses and a falsely accused saboteur. Mm. Ooh. So is it is it you select one of these? So per chapter. The way so the way it would go is that each of us would select one per. So each player gets to select one and start a scene, and then anyone Ooh. can resolve it. Um, you just can only resolve one. You're not allowed to resolve mm-hmm. more than more than one per chapter. So everyone gets to start one. Everyone gets to resolve one, and then we move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. And once a prompt is done, you have, you get to check it off. And one of the things that I would say is you can pick from any chapter if you really want. You just have to stick with the successes. 
So if you're in chapter three and you're like, oh, man, you want to know what would make a lot of sense if uh, they're at the gates and they are angry in chapter one. So let's just use that prompt. But we have to get three successes for it. And you can do that. Mm-hmm. They're, Very cool. they're just suggestions. So Yeah. It's more of a suggestion. So oh, I man. really liked um, either the resources have stopped flowing to the edifice. Mm-hmm. They're going somewhere else instead. Or Ooh, yeah. an ally requires an act of faith are the two that stood out the most to me i wonder who this ally is Mm -hmm. at that point the ally might be the technician could be Mm. because who says that they stay an enemy that's true this could be anime it could be vegeta (laughs) we could turn them to our side like piccolo and all of a sudden they're the uncle to Mm -hmm. this kid um yeah i mean it could be and then uh resources that could be resource like we're cut off from that town down below Oh, yeah. Maybe it could also be like for something relatively because it's pretty easy to start with something kind of mundane. So it could be like bad weather or like the temple is or like the mountain is doing weird things and we can't find the path. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a good way of like uh, foreshadowing. Oh, yeah. The the future. That makes sense. For chapter two. Mm hmm. A terrible secret about the origin of the edifice is whispered in the wrong ear. That's also one of my favorite problems. (laughs) I made these. I shouldn't (laughs) shouldn't have favorites. These shouldn't have favorites. These are all my children. But I mean, like, especially if we talk about that technician possibly like helping us, Mm -hmm. I I think that there's, you know, the chance that like, that, you know, that he finds out about this kid and like whose kid it is. (gasps) And Mm -hmm. like, well, you know, because in this case, like the parent would be the origin of the edifice, right? Yes. So like, um, you know, so if this technician finds out whose kid it is, like, who? Oh, man. I I like Uh, in this scenario, if the technician is brought in to the the sanctuary mm -hmm. to uh, to assist a falsely accused saboteur. Oh, yeah. It'd be really fun. We think that, yes, yeah. I told you that's a really think, good prompt. We think that uh, this technician sabotaged something mm-hmm. because obviously we're all trustful of each other five, six years together mm-hmm. raising clairvoyance. Obviously, this outsider has to be the one. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's that sabotage. Maybe it's one of us. Maybe it's one of us. Maybe it's the edifice herself. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe it's clairvoyance <gasps> did something and didn't and doesn't want to fess up to it because she's five years old. Um, right uh-huh. and like doesn't even realize yeah. that like yeah or, and we didn't even ask her or maybe she did something that she was supposed to and we misinterpreted it as sabotage oh or something something that her sort of deity deitist yeah. nature is kind of influencing yes. it's like starting to uh awaken a little bit Mm -hmm. yeah her powers are starting to manifest a little bit Mm -hmm. in chapter three an old enemy makes a bold move could be the powers Mm. from beyond Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the heralds the heralds uh they're we haven't even talked about Mm -hmm. the heralds i mean the war begins in chapter two could also be the heralds begin war upon this Mm -hmm. this version what about the what about the dad too oh yeah the general the the general general. definitely arrives at some point Um, Mm -hmm. Betrayal oh, from the closest source. They've returned and they're not taking no for an answer. Could be the dad returning. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gosh, there's so many good prompts here. These are really good. I also Thanks. I also liked the um, the death of a leader changes the situation. Mm-hmm. Like I, it doesn't ha- have to be. Do, does do these prompts have to create bad conflict? Points? No, so they need to result. They need to create a situation that makes it yeah. hard for us to uh, work on the edifice to, to keep mm-hmm. working towards creating the edifice. They need to be kind of like something, yeah, that stops us or makes it difficult or like would take resources away from us, and yeah. we need to resolve. What I was kind of thinking was, what if the the leader of this country was the driving force for all the warmongering? Mm-hmm. And the succeeder uh, wanted peace and wanted a better nation. So now there's less incentive to to fight to fight against it. Yeah, that means that the big bad guys at the very end are the heralds. Yeah. Yeah. So like we've spent all this time worrying about this technician and the dad and all that kind of stuff, but really like they aren't the thing that we need to worry about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I guess what we could do is we could jump to the ending and decide if. 
clairvoyance manages to hold them off with our uh, finale. And I can we can I can talk to you quickly about how we would decide how our characters how our characters Ooh. endings would go. Yes, please. So yes. the first thing you're supposed to do is you decide your character ending prompt. Um, and you spend points on that, and then anything left over gets added to the edifice. So as I said, if you're selfish and you buy yourself a really good ending, the edifice may not have enough points. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh. And you have to decide that right away? Yep. You have to spend I, at, no, at the very end to, of the game. You have to spend at least three points not to be dead or dying. Yep. So zero. Wow. You're dead or dying. Either way, it's an unglorious ending, forgotten and alone. Three. It eats at you, and you'll never forget. It might be your downfall. Six, it's bittersweet. You didn't get what you wanted. Nine, you got what you needed, but not what you wanted. Twelve, you achieved your goals, but one thing still nags at you. One mistake, never to be forgotten. Fifteen, you're comfortable, and you got what you wanted, but it wasn't clean, and it wasn't neat or tidy. And eighteen, no matter what hardships you went through, you've come out on top. You got everything you wanted. The future's looking even brighter. And I'll tell you, people tend to get fourteen. It's like 20 to 7 is the average. Ooh. You can get more. It's possible for you to get like 25, I think. Mm-hmm. And so the edifice's ending is everybody's pooled together yeah. stuff. You right? add all of everyone's leftover together and okay. zero, which is if you mark all the failed states, um, this is what happens automatically. All your efforts have been in vain. Too much was state. Too much was stacked against you, and the edifice will never be completed. Four, you put blood, sweat, and tears into it, but the edifice is temporary and will eventually fade from history. Eight, someone will make a ter- someone made a terrible mistake. The ed- edifice has been completed, but at a great cost. Twelve, it is complete, but it will be a constant battle to keep it standing. Sixteen, the edifice has been completed and it is standing strong. But with it will stand the mark of the factions that moved against you. Their legacy will also survive. 20. The edifice will endure as long as your descendants and disciples attend to it. And 24 plus. Your hard work paid off. The edifice has brought fame and fortune to everyone involved and your names are preserved. Man, so it's really hard to have a happy, happy ending. (laughs) Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean it's possible. I've we've definitely. I, it's I think easier than you think, especially if everyone makes like f- gets like fourteen plus mm-hmm. points, which mm-hmm. isn't super hard as long as you play into your archetype at least a couple times. Because remember, yeah. you have technically on your sheet you have mm-hmm. fifth fourteen uh, plus three. You start with fourteen, right? Yes, but you also get the three from your profession technically if you count oh, that and yeah. your dice spends. You wouldn't count true. your. It, let's say you didn't spend any penalties because the penalties mm-hmm. technically cancel themselves out unless you take away a one, in which case it does mm-hmm. affect you. Um, but you technically have, I'm doing math, 17 to start. Mm-hmm. And so if you manage to spend all of those, mm-hmm. you're pretty good. You're, you're, you are you can buy a pretty good ending. Um, but if you like make, let's say, only 17 and everyone chooses like between... Um, Let's see. Chooses between like nine to three. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of points to pool. Yeah. So, and you're not allowed to talk That's about true. it or collaborate. You have to choose it in Ooh. silence. Uh, oh, man. Ah. That is brutal. I love it. Uh huh. And then I love it because I feel like that's such a good like reveal at the end, too, yeah. of like, so did we do it or no? <sighs> it's good. But you're supposed to reveal the edifice first and then talk about personal endings. Oh. So good. My favorite oh, is the bittersweet. So I always s- pick the bittersweet one. <laughs> Interesting. So you you basically say I have this many points to put towards the edifice, mm-hmm. and you don't state how many you had in total. Wow. Wow. Okay. You, this is a lot for Ryan to process right now. Yeah, but, do, <laughs> but do you see why I say like it's definitely called selfishness for a reason? Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because at the end, if you did, if you were selfish at the moment, you're. Your future, your, if you're selfish, once again, your future may be bright, but the thing you worked on will not. And the thing that you worked on with the community especially will not. Mm-hmm. But I, I think this is very important that it's up to the players because the players are the ones that know their characters the best. The dice don't know your characters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so being able to make that choice, I think, is m- it's more devastating than rolling dice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Being put in that position to have it make that difficult choice is chef kiss. I love yeah. it. <laughs> But I mean, we could talk about like 
what ending you would hypothetically pick for them, depending on how many points you have. Yeah, I was thinking, um, like, if I put in, like, if say if we had, like, 14-ish points Mm -hmm. on average, I would probably put it into the bittersweet one, where Mm -hmm. I didn't get what I wanted, or uh, it eats at you in order to um, increase the chance that the edifice is better off in the end mm. because this is this is more important than us this is this is this is something that's literally world changing and this could end all of the conflict in the world I would... so why why do i care what happens to me <sighs> that's good you're you hold on you want to know what you are you're the buttress you're the ally it's a it's the sam gamgee <laughs> character <laughs> <laughs> that's yep that's you yeah that 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 tracks um i would probably <laughs> pick it depends on how many points i have but if i had around like below like around 10 like 14 to 10 um i'd honestly probably go for zero because i think that that's what i don't think this character would be <sighs> this character's cousin has lost her life and it sounds like a lot mm-hmm. more people will get in a lot like in really bad scrapes and be very hurt about this so i think it makes sense for them to lay down their life for this because other people already have and like mm-hmm. they were a soldier like they were a soldier this is what they do but it sounds like laying down your life in a non-glamorous way no so no, no not like a sacrifice to save everything sort it of way, could right? be a sacrifice to save everything the only thing is you're they don't know that you sacrificed yourself to save. oh everything. yeah that would make sense. So it can be glorious to one or two people, but those that one or two people, those one or two people will die eventually, and they mm-hmm. won't know. They won't, you won't be associated with the edifice. So like, yes, she wouldn't know probably that I laid down my life for her. Mm-hmm. She would just always wonder where I went, or maybe I abandoned her. Oh, that's sad. Um, <laughs> I. I must have a doctor character. Ah, yes, sad ending. My favorite. <laughs> so, um, it's the trope. I, mean, I really I'm, like. I would pick something kind of selfish. I Do mean, it. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna go with nine. I'm gonna say you got what you needed, but not what you wanted. Because I think mm-hmm. that like I feel guilty about it, but like <laughs> it's not my god. So yeah, do it. It makes sense. Yeah, I'm gonna go with nine. I'm gonna yeah. say you got what you needed, but not what you. So wanted. if it was fourteen, we would have. I'm telling you right now, we did twenty. We did twenty-five. Oh wow! So they stack up pretty fast, especially when you have a lot of people. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense um, because it it sounds like we could have picked you. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like Amelia, your character didn't believe in this, mm-hmm. didn't want this to be something that's like a thing, mm-hmm. obviously. But then it turns out it was right. You got what you needed. Not what you wanted. Right. Which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. we followed our, although I'm kind of sad dead artist is a trope I'm not a huge fan of, but I think for this character, it makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, it makes sense because they, they've they they've been about doing anything to save this mm-hmm. person. And they were literally yeah. tasked by someone who died to do the same thing. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I probably had to do something i maybe i had to use my instrument in the finale in the way that i didn't want to and maybe it had some collateral damage and you still have to live live with that burden i still have to because it's it protected me but not those around me i think that you had to use it against the heralds yeah oh but i want to say that uh our hard work paid off Mm -hmm. and she still brought attention to our names, even though if it was fleeting and it wasn't what we needed, or it wasn't what we wanted. Well, our names are preserved. Our names are preserved, mm-hmm. even yeah. though they don't know much about me. Yeah. And yeah. they know that you disappeared afterward. And they know yeah. that you weren't necessarily happy with it, but you're still like a hero. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she will bring peace. And prosperity. Aww. Aww. We did it. Yay. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of got to play this game, sort of, except yeah, we skipped the, the middle part where we do all the role play. <laughs> uh huh. That's awesome. Um, so, about the system as a whole, uh, what do you think about how it plays and how it lends to character development? And how do you think the characters change as people within the narrative as you actually play the game? 
Oh, uh, <laughs> I think a lot. Because, like, as much as, again, as I said, as much as you have, like, stuff on a sheet, that changes in play a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you have to reinterpret your secret because someone yeah. has something similar and you're like, damn. Let me just, okay, <laughs> hold on a second. <laughs> I am not a princess. Um, uh-huh. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, that has to happen sometimes. And I think there's a lot of invention with playing your character that changes it. Um, because, like, some things could happen mm-hmm. that are very different. But I think generally, um, the because it's a three-act story, Mm-hmm. It tends to do kind of a similar character arc that movies and stories with three act stories tend to have. Mm-hmm. Um, and also because there is a secret, secrets kind of have baggage attached to them. And because yeah. a lot of the characters, you're supposed to either hear secrets or uh, tell secrets. Some you don't you don't tell anyone anything. Mm-hmm. Um, like the lintel, you're never supposed to tell. It can still come out and you won't lose points, but you won't gain points for it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just not something you need to focus on unless right. you feel it's important. Uh, mm-hmm. And because those secrets are going to happen and because they're probably going to be resolved, your characters are going to change because they're not going to have that kind of like weight. They're going to be able to kind of evolve into different things. And usually secrets tend to be revealed in the second and third chapters so usually it's like a bum 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 moment near the end and then they Mm -hmm. can get to have their like growing up moment later on um nice yeah and i think it's when you get to rp there's a lot more of the there's even more of that kind of community feel Mm -hmm. uh because you get to kind of be like uh there's a helping mechanic which was really important because i think I mean, the whole point is helping and you can give a dice mm-hmm. to someone and everyone can do it. So you can all put your all effort into, you can put your all into a role. Nice. And try to accomplish something together. And I think that's another element where I'm like, you you do end up more of a community at the end than just creating characters and talking about that's it. That's really cool. I like that so much. I'll run it. <laughs> I need to run it more often. <laughs> You've convinced me. Normally, we talk about advancement um, in a segment that we call Take It Up Level, but, you know, uh, this game doesn't have traditional advancement because it's designed for one-shots, and this game has all of these character developments and and conflicts that escalate, but we've kind of already covered all of that. They're an, or- they're an organic process that happens yeah. outside of mechanics, or there's a mechanic for which is the secret for it, but it's not there. Not traditional yeah. leveling. You're not, mm-hmm. oh, I revealed this secret. Now I get to go to my next secret. Like, no, mm-hmm. you get one. <laughs> you yeah. get your one secret. That's <laughs> it. Your mom lets you have two secrets. That's the facade. The facade gets to have two secrets. <laughs> they can have a fake secret and a real secret. Oh, very Ooh. cool. I kind of like yeah. that. That's yeah. pretty good. If you actually want the, the images for the cars to look, or no, I think I have the description of everything in the, yeah. You do. Yeah, mm-hmm. you do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some of them I'm, uh, the original, just a fun thing, the original f- uh, foundation was it had an ability where you could basically die during the end of the third, you could choose to die any time in the third chapter and give your points to someone else who you were a mentor to. Oh. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I, unfortunately, it didn't fit in the way I was running. I wanted to do the game now, and it would have mm-hmm. been the only one with a special ability, so I had to cut it, but. Oh, yeah. <sighs> yeah. It's my favorite. I, I want to use that <laughs> in something. Yeah. I think that, like, it could be a thing that, like, you can talk out at the table and, like, could possibly happen, mm-hmm. but, like, I, maybe not built in. Oh, yeah. No, that's definitely a mod that I that is, like, tucked in my pocket for later if uh-huh. that ever comes up. <laughs> yes. Also, I feel like Absolutely. that might be something. I think the concept for that mechanic is fun and could probably be good in other games that are community-based. Mm-hmm. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Just not this one. Well, awesome. Uh, Devin, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Edifice uh, and the character creation for Edifice. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. Can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you and what sort of things you're working on? Yeah, um, I am currently working on the Shadow of the Cobalt 2 art, which will be actually up by the time this comes out. So you can go check that out. Um, it's very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's my phone wallpaper right now. <laughs> awesome. I'm very excited. It's, it's so um, good. Right there. Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Look forward to seeing my art in uh, a card game called Halamas Val- by uh, Fidget Creative. And you also see my art in Descent into Midnight, which is a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Um, should be on Kickstarter at some point, I hope, because I want to back it. Yeah, I think they said later this year. Yes. So please, yes, please. Fingers crossed. Awesome. You've played it. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, you can find me at my website, which is www.devingeorgestudios.com. Devin spelled with an O. Um, <laughs> you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at D, as in the letter D, George Studios. Um, and that's, I think that's most of my, that's my only two social media platforms right now. <laughs> <laughs> two is plenty. <laughs> I don't think I can do any more. <laughs> Well, Devin, thank you so much for sitting down with us. And thank you to everybody for listening. We will be back next week. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter, at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter, at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter, at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license, or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the ship notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit One Shot Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep, keep going. <laughs> if you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Backstory. Backstory is a cozy, thoughtful interview show featuring the most fascinating folks in role-playing. Join host Alex Roberts as she gets to know game designers, LARP rights, scholars, community organizers, and more. From emerging artists to seasoned veterans, guests open up about their creative process, what keeps them engaged, and their visions for the future of role-playing. I did it this time, and I have waveforms! Yay! Yeah. Me too, yeah. waveforms! I sure am seeing things wiggle. <laughs> awesome. We're going to we're going to need that in song form. I yeah, we, we always have to sing about the wave forms. Yep. <laughs> like I am not a podcaster. I do art. <laughs> uh, <laughs> welcome to Welcome to Character <laughs> Evolution Cast with Devin Dorge talking about world building. Oh, please. I am I mean, I'm not like a big name, so honestly, I don't know if you want to have me on, but I'm I have so many thoughts about world we had, building. Mm-hmm. And we had evil Ryan on this show, so like That's fair. <laughs> who, who who is that guy? I don't know that guy. Uh-huh. Um it was very confusing. I really enjoyed him as a guest though. <laughs> I was like, I like this evil Ryan. Um him and Justin. Even though he has my name. Oh, sorry. He has my name. I don't like it. Mm, yeah. Mood. Yeah, you're both Ryan B. I used to I, I know. Like, Stupid. One of you guys have to be Brian, and the other one has to be Ryan. One of you should just be Brian. <laughs> no. No, no, no. The other Ryan has to be Brian. I lied. Brian. B I Y A N. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. But uh, yes, the other one definitely has to be Brian. I don't know anything about anime, and they keep talking to me about it. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I went to Japan, and I speak <clears throat> Japanese. I feel like.
I feel like I'm deeper in the hole over here. <laughs> just like, uh-huh. help. I don't even like samurai. I don't even care about samurai. <laughs> oh, I love samurai so much. I mean, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there, but I just, uh, my, that's not, that's not why I'm in it. <laughs> but everyone, okay, so everyone is like in love with the concept of a ronin, and I feel like I'm the only one who hates the idea of a ronin. I, they just always think of them as like kind of dirty. Okay, no. Like take a bath. No, but the whole fun <laughs> bit is like the concept of <laughs> you can't get what you want and you have to do your duty. And that's such a, I don't know, that's a struggle that I feel in my core. My core. Well, I think, so. and that's what I like. Th- I think that's like what draws me to like that genre. Cause like yeah. I don't give a shit oh, like, about like swords and shit. Oh, like, like, like yeah. whatever. Like, I, which I feel like is why like a lot of dudes are like, oh yeah, swords. And I'm like, I don't care. But like, I, I mean, like I feel the, you. like, <laughs> my heart goes dokey dokey for a good Claymore. <laughs> Uh, I just like I like the like tragedy and like the mixing of like my wants and my needs and like trying to balance those things. And you're right, like a Ronin doesn't have that. So like, what's the oh, f- language point? Yeah, exactly. What the f- oh, language is the point of being a samurai if you're a f- oh, language in Ronin? It's not interesting. I don't care. Bye. Right now, you're just a weirdo with a sword. Now you are. You. Now you're a Dungeons and Dragons game, and I am clearly disinterested. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Tr- I've been trying to escape from D and D for five years. I'm good, thanks. I'm finally getting to dun- oh. I'm, or D and D. I'm finally moving over to Dungeon World, and I'm happy. <laughs> We're getting. Yeah, I was say, didn't you just finish running like a really long D and D campaign? No, that's tomorrow. Oh, <sighs> almost done. You're so close. No. I'm excited <laughs> to never play D again. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. Do you remember all your teachers being like, you can't rely on spell check because it's not, and I'm like, <laughs> okay. And they all like told us our handwriting mattered too. Come on now. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> there was like a teachers. I had a choice in my brain. Like my brain either had space for being able to like type well or be able to do cursive well. And I, of course I picked typing because like, no, I'm not going to yeah. learn cursive. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Like this is America. Yeah. It's, uh, it's beautiful, uh, and I, my- I do kind of wish I could. And I've actually tried to go back and learn a couple times, but it's been hard. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I went to Catholic school, so like I can do cursive, like yeah. you know. But I was. Yeah, not. I feel you. I still can't spell. <laughs> I can do cursive, but I can't spell. <laughs> that sure says something. <laughs> oh, so fun fact, and I actually can hold on. Let me pull this out for you. Speaking of making a people, uh, one of the types of people in my setting is a bird people. Um, And I drew one, and it's really fun because she's literally, her face is literally me because I used myself as a reference. But this is what she looks like. (laughs) Oh, I love it. Yeah. I got to make a bird people, and I was really happy. And I put her in armor, and I was like, this is my favorite things together, armor and birds. Yes. (laughs) More birds should wear armor. Uh That's true. I'm going to draw more. Um. You should design some bird armor once you're done with your jewelry stuff. <laughs> you can move on to bird. I have armor. to design a bird first, and then we'll move on to bird. But I mean, a, like a bird that's made out of metal is kind of like bird armor, right? Well, I think you just hollow it out and put the bird inside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that's how that works. <laughs> All right. Now I'm just thinking of bird mechs, like regular <laughs> si- regular size people mech suits for regular size birds to fit inside. <laughs> Oh my god, you don't have to be like, okay, but you know, like, okay, so you know how, like, there's some birds that are, like, really small, like, like, um, Uh like chickadees. Yep, chickadees, yep. Yeah, and then, you know, you'd have to, no, because, like, (sighs) per size to them, it would just be, like, this big. It wouldn't be quite, like, a human. And it wouldn't be shaped like a human, it'd be shaped like birds. No, you gotta shape it like a human, just because it's so cool. No, because that becomes a gag. If you want it to be serious, that's true. Because humans make human mechs. Exactly. Birds gotta make bird mechs. They gotta make bird mechs. It's the next evolution of bird samurai. Oh my god. I think Ryan, I don't I think you realize that you like stumbled into like Devin's secret passion I'm, here. That like I'm a passion. Devin is all about mechs and robots. Uh huh. And I like really on like birds. The shadow of the. Like on oh the shadow of the Cabal server, Devin's name right now is Devin, the Jude of Transformers. <laughs> Hold on. I have something I'm gonna say. I have a Transformers belt right now on. Oh man. I am and also out there in my living room is my collection of Transformers models. Oh, toys. Devin. They're toys. Devin, you are my people. <laughs> I I am I am How have we not been friends before this? <laughs> we have to like, are, so you're oh. a Transformers fan. Oh yeah. Hundred <laughs> percent. Like he's 
says that like who wouldn't have you? Like, oh, yeah. I was born in 1980, <laughs> of course. I'm like what? I mean, I was born in grown man. I was born in like 96, and I still managed to get there. So like, uh-huh. like listen, God, it, so... it, all walks yeah. of life. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, mine mine was by like literally. You were born in 1980. You're pretty much guaranteed to like the Transformers. Have you watched the Bumblebee movie? Uh huh. It was. What did you think? It was so good. It was so good. Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, can we talk about the first, like, ten minutes on Cybertron? <laughs> yes. Also, Soundwave, my husband. Oh, Soundwave. Okay, oh, Soundwave uh, annoyed me a little bit because it was on Cybertron and it was still kind oh, yeah, of, like, a tape, tape deck. deck. Yeah, and I was like, yeah. but but they haven't been to Earth. Where's the, where's the tape deck coming from? Yeah. I'm so confused. I agree with that, but I'm also very happy just to be able to, like, see that. I also think Frank Welker played his voice, which is like, yes, thank God. Oh, yeah. Um, I also want to say, I like that they didn't show Megatron. Yes. But I'm kind of upset that they didn't tell us the names of the bad guys because it's so important. It's, uh-huh. Every single character is important in Transformers because the idea of the Civil War is that it's a war of attrition, which means that every good guy and bad guy needs to be named and every death is meaningful because there's only like 500 of them left. Uh Uh-huh. And that's why like Blitzwing not having a name and Dropkick and like Shatter not ever introducing themselves like defies that kind of concept of of, like attrition and like coming Mm -hmm. to the end of like an era of existence. Although, you know, the IDW comics kind of changed that. So maybe that's Mm -hmm. where they're going. It might be in the, like, extended version. Yeah. Like, we don't need to know their names. It's not important to the story. God, that makes me angry. Not not enough explosions. No. (laughs) (laughs) Michael Bay makes me angry. (laughs) I I still still think of, like, the... um, did you ever see the robot chicken Michael Bay sketch? I just said, my boss blew. <laughs> there's a really good I think Studio of. C sketch that has Michael Bay in it where they're like, there's a grease fire in the kitchen. And the person's like, save it for Michael Bay. And it's <laughs> like, uh, yeah, uh, I rewrote the fourth Transformer, Michael Bay Transformer movie. Like I rewrote oh, everything amazing. that would happen if it was a good movie because I got angry. Was that? Was that the night one or was that Age of Extinction? That's the one with the oh, robot the extinction dinosaurs. One. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I, yeah, I think I only saw the first three. I've watched. Uh, oh, definitely the third five. one. We went and hate watched. Mm-hmm. I did that with the fourth More one. Than once. <laughs> More than once. Like it was mm-hmm. me and my ex and like his best friend. Like we went and we were like, "This is so bad. Let's get popcorn." <laughs> <laughs> I some of okay. Like, the first three I can hate watch because they, like, go off, like, whatever. But they still have kind of the mm-hmm. core enough that I'm like, yeah, okay, you're making a Transformers movie. But the fifth and the – the fourth and the fifth one make me viscerally angry that it's really <laughs> hard for me to watch it. I'm like, I I have to, like, chew on some wood. I'm so angry. Like, mm-hmm. I have to – yeah. Oh, anyway, have you ever read any of the IDW comics? No. <sighs> Ryan. I know. I don't have time anymore. Ryan. I've got two little ones. Ryan. Maybe okay. Read them okay. to them. It's story time. Kids. Okay. Uh, M- maybe some of them are kind of dark. <laughs> I guess that's true. But you know, you can save those for later. The MTMT. Look, you gotta learn about the world yeah. sometimes. The more than meets the eye in Lost Light comics, though, are actually fantastic, and I did read those to my brothers who are also small. So, <laughs> <laughs> and my mom didn't say anything. So, although I still get chills from "You Got the Touch" every time you hear that song. Mm-hmm. Uh, I cry because the original I think Transformer of... movie is uh, one of the best. The 1986, uh, yeah, 1986 one. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. it's. I think whenever I hear that song, I tear up because I think about all yep. of this. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Why are we the same person? <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, we should probably get on topic because I will keep talking about Transformers and how much I love yep. Minimus Ambus. Uh. <laughs> Ryan, you. <laughs> You stepped down a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. So when I mentioned Simpatico, the idea is to make it maybe a Transformers podcast where we review episodes and comics of Transformers. Oh, nice. Oh. Yeah, that's. I believe in you. And this all came from Bird Mix. <sighs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Which I, I really want to make. I really want to make a game now that's about Bird Mix. Hey, hit me up. <laughs> well, I'm sure that that can be one of your genres. <laughs> You know, I mech uh, genre was one of the genres I wanted to throw out there. Please, uh, um, yeah. I mean, like Devin can maybe co-write that. One. Yeah, I'm down. I I am 100 percent looking for co-writers for um, future modules because uh, I'm releasing the game with three modules. 
fantasy superheroes and magical girls. Nice. Um, I'm and, not actually super good in mecha. I'm more robots that aren't piloted. Right. <laughs> It's more like unmanned robots. If you want mm-hmm. sci-fi, I am a huge hard sci-fi fan, though. I have sci-fi as one of the genres I would really like to have done. Mm-hmm. Um, I am picturing it as a Star Wars, Star Trek mix. Yep, I'm a Star Wars, Star Trek fan. <laughs> <I've>... Excellent. <laughs> awesome. One of my... Amazing. I have a Star Trek badge thing somewhere around here, but I think it's mm-hmm. in my bag. I can't show you my whole living room is, is yeah. Star Wars. <laughs> I have, like, Star Wars printed couch pillows. God. <laughs> I made them because they didn't I, They didn't have ones that I wanted, so I bought some fabric and made them. Amazing. I, I don't have too much. I really want the uh, Nicolas Cage face with, like, the, the shiny thing that you can turn over and it's, like, red. Yes. That's what I really want. <laughs> I want to do that, but then I want to bring it over and Dakota not to know about it and then leave it in his couch, on his couch. That's my goal. Uh, oh, let's scare the oh, language. Get out yes. of him. Beautiful. I love it. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. We should do this, though. Yeah, uh-huh. sorry. Ryan, you have, no, Ryan has to edit this on. I really don't. I'm not pagan. I'm just pagan adjacent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just live with a witch. I don't know. Um, so. <laughs> Just gonna help her do some blood sacrifices. Uh... Sorry, I started yawning and now I can't stop. Oh no! <laughs> you started me. Uh oh. I know. Sorry. <sighs> oh no! <laughs> stop it. <laughs> okay, so let's just take a short nap break. Darn, and darn we'll video chat. Yeah, it's like nine thirty where I'm at. It's okay. I've got another like two hours in me. <laughs> uh huh. I got I got about three in me, so I'm good. I could definitely. Um, I have a lot of energy. I could push. I can push. I could go. <laughs> I could stay up forever. No, it should not take off. Mm-hmm. He was also in a video game, Omicron, the Nomad Soul. It was a computer game, um, and he played a character who was an NPC that played music in underground music like performance things because music was illegal in this world. Is that and you? Oh my god. This could be and, you. <laughs> and, and like, you could go and find these secret hidden locations in the game and then get this, like, performance that was motion captured of David Bowie singing original songs for the game, uh, oh, which was just wow. fantastic. I really like that. Yeah. This recording has gone. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We're, like, I'm very good at tangents. No, and fine. Like, I'm not good at steering people on topic at all. No, so. don't worry about it. Uh, It'll just, um, we'll have longer episodes because there'll be lots of outtakes of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just like, don't cut anything. Keep all the Transformers bits. Yes. Yeah. We'll oh, that's God, one of the sure. outtakes for sure. Yeah. Please. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor did like a field trip in preschool to do Taekwondo because that's what Eleanor needs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was at Gen Con when they did it, though, and, like, she video called me, and she was like, Mom, I punched some wood. Yeah. And I was like, great job, honey. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've yeah. definitely... It's like, that's what Eleanor needed was to learn yeah. how to punch. Yeah. I, there's a... I think little, little, little kids, unless they're very responsible, it's not great to introduce them to that immediately. It's something that you need to make sure that they're responsible yeah. enough not to use in inappropriate situations. I... Yeah, I mean, for her, I think it would be good just because, like, she needs the physical yeah. element of it. Like, she needs to do something. Just make with sure that it goes to a dojo activity. that really like reinforces mm-hmm. the like this is for self defense oh, for sure. because that can get that can get bad <laughs> really quickly. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. I have when brothers you, that did taekwondo and they've done some stupid stuff. So yeah, I did taekwondo well, as an adult. That's always are dumb. And mm-hmm. there was a three year old in the class. Oh. Um, and he was he was super adorable, <laughs> but. Um, like at the beginning, uh, when he started, he was very, you know, energetic and, uh, not completely focused, but like over the year that I had taken this, like I saw him getting more and more focused and more and more, uh, like dedicated uh, and directed. Dedic- yeah. Yeah. And like taking it seriously instead of, oh, this is playtime. I thought that was really cool to see oh, him, awesome. uh, kind of evolve that way. Yeah. That's really cool. That's what I need for Eleanor. <laughs> Some discipline. <laughs> I mean, for real, that kid is. Awesome. Send her to a to a hippie commune in the middle of the science fantasy forest. Uh huh. Yes. Let's do it. Yes, science fantasy hippie commune boarding school. 
Isn't that Harry Potter? <laughs> <laughs> and cheese curds are good. Cheese curds are good. Oh my god. Now you're making me want cheese curds so bad. I wish I could eat cheese curds. Uh, that sounds really good. I just love cheese. My character loves cheese. <laughs> That's my secret. That's my secret. No. I, uh... I'll do anything for cheese. <laughs> but I also want to say, you making that up, you are game designing. It's well, true. Maybe. I went how I how I thought it was supposed to go. <laughs> no, no, no. That's what I mean. When you improvise and you change the rules or do what you, you can, you are game designing. That's where, that's where it starts. Mm-hmm. That's the very beginning. Oh, yeah. The first time... I can never mind. I'll explain the first time I ever game designed because it was like the second time I ever played anything ever. Well, we uh, talked about that is... with James, like, and when we were talking to mm-hmm. him about like running games and designing games and stuff like that too. He's like, anytime you house rule something, anytime you sit down and you say, you know what, we are going to do, um, uh, like we're going to create our characters in a specific way. Like if you decide to do, um, yeah, your game designing, right? He's like, you are making a design decision, like yeah, about because how, like, like the experience that you want to have in that game is a design decision. Mm-hmm. Because, and I think this is okay. Maybe we should save what, this for what, our discussion <laughs> portion, though. Okay, yeah. Just remind me about big C creativity and little C creativity because there's a whole thing about this in the psychology of creativity um, yeah. that. I kind of yeah. have a controversial opinion mm-hmm. on, oh, okay. which is similar to his. Oh, my controversial opinion is big C creativity doesn't really exist. <gasps> okay, we're gonna have to get into this. Okay, <laughs> did we finish plugging your stuff? Yes. Where did we leave off? I plugged we myself. Plugged okay, it. so now you just have to take us home, Amelia. Okay. Amelia. 